All Alone in the Universe by Lynn Ray Perkins. Essential question. How does a new friendship affect an old one? Deb and her best friend Maureen Burke have grown up together in the same small town and it seems as if they will be inseparable forever. One summer, though, Maureen's new relationship with classmate Glenna Flaber puts their friendship in jeopardy. The day after Debbie returns from a family vacation, the three girls go to a carnival. Three is a lousy number in a lot of ways. One of those ways is that carnivals always have rides with seats that hold two people. So one person has to act as if she doesn't mind waiting by the fence or riding in a seat by herself or with some other leftover. This is why the three musketeers became friends with D'Artagnan. Not because of carnivals, but because the number three is not a happy number. I know that in geometry, the triangle is supposed to be an extremely stable shape, as in pyramids. But in real life, triangles are almost never equilateral. There are always two corners that are closer together, while the third is off a little ways by itself. I was off a little ways eating some french fries from my paper boat, watching Glenna and Maureen ride the Calypso, when the first idea came to me that Maureen actually liked Glenna. Glenna was shouting over the noise and music of the ride. Whatever she shouted, it made Maureen laugh and Glenna was laughing too. They were spinning around together and laughing, their hands up in the air, slammed together by centrifugal force against the painted metal shell of their twirling car. I was in some other not laughing universe, leaning on a fence that was standing perfectly still. The ride ended and they tumbled and spun, still laughing out of the car and through the gate. It seemed as if they might tumble right past me then, and I blurted out, anyone want a french fry? Maureen spun my way and said, oh yummy. Glenna said, no thanks, I don't like greasy food. This was wise, because I was planning to put a curse on her french fry that would make her throw up on the next ride. Oh well. I shrugged more for us. Then I said, I love greasy food, especially when it is salty, added Maureen. We gobbled up the french fries and now it was Maureen and I who were together while Glenna remained on her greasiless, unsalted planet. Let's go on the zipper, I said to Maureen. Okay, she said. So we did, and then we all played a game of tossing quarters on plates balanced on bottle tops. I won a lime green cross-eyed bunny, which I gave to Maureen. I said, here, I want you to have this because you mean so much to me and because I don't want to carry it around. She grinned and said, oh wow, thanks a lot. She glanced down at the bunny as she took it, then held it up to Glenna and said, Does this remind you of anything? Glenna crossed her eyes. They both laughed, and that was one for Glenna. Then it was her turn to ride with Maureen. And that was two. Glenna and I weren't taking any turns together, but no one mentioned that. Maureen was too busy having a great time to notice. Glenna was having a great time too. I wasn't exactly having a great time. I felt off balance, as if someone kept borrowing my right foot for a few minutes, 
as if someone were moving into my house while I still lived there. The three of us wobbled around the dinky midway, like a triangle trying to walk. I could see the grass already turning yellow under the parked trailers and their thick, tangled piles of extension cords. I could feel some odd new feelings, uneasy, spiteful, shapeless ones, creeping in. I hate this stupid carnival, I thought, sitting on a bench across from the ferry's wheel as the other two points of the triangle rose up into the blue sky. When we had spent all the money, Mrs. Berkey was willing to throw down the drain. We walked back to the car, where she was waiting, reading a book. It made sense geographically for me to be dropped off first. I got out and watched the car pull away. It was no different from a million times before. Through the rear window, beyond the collapsed tissue box and the green bunny, I saw Marin's and Glenn's head turn toward each other and I felt myself falling away behind. But what could I do? I lived here. It was where I had to get out. I walked over to rinse my feet off under the spigot. I didn't know how to wash away a crumbiness that seemed to be swimming around in my heart. The garage door opened and my dad pushed the lawnmower out from inside. He put a pretend surprised look on his face. Why, hello there, long lost daughter, he said. How's every little thing? Okay, I said. I mustered up a smile from somewhere, mostly from his words and the sounds of his voice. His words and his voice and my scrounged up smile pushed the crummy feeling a little way off to the side. And I thought, probably, it was all in my mind. It's because I was on vacation, I thought. I'm back now. Don't be a dope, I thought. Maureen is your best friend. But something was happening. Something I couldn't see was shifting. When Marin and I were together without Glenna, everything seemed fine, almost. We had fun. We still laughed a lot. But before, when we laughed, we were just laughing. We couldn't help it. It just happened. Laughing and other kinds of thoughts or feelings traveled between us like breathing. Now I found myself holding on to good moments as if I could save them up and prove something to somebody. It was getting hard even to be with Maureen without Glenna because Glenna was there so much. When I called Maureen on the phone, Glenna had already called, or Maureen wasn't at home because she was sleeping over at Glenna's, or I could hear Glenna's deep voice in the background. Maureen always invited me to come along, and I would go, even though being together with Maureen and Glenna was not that much fun. I couldn't figure out how Glenna managed to make so many plans so far ahead all the time. On summer mornings, when you first wake up, you hear the birds chirping and a shady green light filters through the leaves and a coolness in the air means it still feels good to have at least a sheet pulled up over your shoulders. Maybe there is the faint whining and clunking of a garbage truck on a nearby street. For a minute or two, you don't even think of any personal facts, like what your name is, or what town you live in, 
or what kind of life you might be having. Then you hear your mother outside talking to a neighbor or banging around in the kitchen. Or you roll over and see your sister still asleep in the other bed. You know who you are now. And your mind eventually gets around to what you might be doing that day. Which is when your heart feels light or thinks a little bit depending. Analyze the text. Point of view. How does the author develop Debbie's point of view of Glenna? What clues tell you how Debbie feels about her? From the back seat of the Flavors car, Glenna asked her mother what day they would be leaving for their vacation. My ears pricked up, an unexpected ray of Hope lit up little dioramas in my head. Happy pictures of a week or two without Glenna. A scrap of song from a passing radio furled through the open window. Finally, I thought, finally. Trying to keep my face calm, I waited for Mrs. Flavor's answer. Saturday, she said, but early so probably Maren should stay over Friday night. What for? I thought giddily. So she can wave goodbye? That way she will be sure to get up in time. Mrs. Flavor went on. She threw a quick grin over her shoulder at Maren. Maren and Glenna grinned at each other. We'll just roll you out of bed and into the car, Maureen, said Mrs. Flavor in a jolly way. A tide of comprehension rushed in all around me, separating my little island from the shore where the three of them stood, getting into the car to drive away. Where are you going? I couldn't help asking. Apparently, they could still hear my voice, although it sounded far away, even to me. At least Mrs. Flavor could. Analyze the text. Characters' motivations. What does Debbie say and do when she finds out Maureen will be going on vacation with Glenna's family? Barth Lake, she answered. We have a camp up there. We decide to let Glenna take it along a friend this year. We'll be sitting on each other's lap, but we figure the more the merrier. I don't know what else she said, but all the sentences had exclamation points at the end. The water rose over my island and lapped around my ankles. I pressed my fingers into my knees then lifted them and watched the yellow-white spots disappear. Maren's knees were right next to mine. There was her hand on the car seat, with the fingernails beaten down below the nubs, as familiar to me as my own. I looked out the window at whatever was passing by. I felt mean and small. Like something wetted up, weightless, like something that doesn't even matter. Mrs. Flavor's voice charbled merrily away, cramming the air with colorful pictures of capsizing rowboats and dinners of fish fried, with their heads still on and the eyeballs looking right at you. I could hear Glenna telling Marn that. Barth Lake was the seventh largest man-made lake in the state. Really? I heard myself say. That is so interesting. Suddenly it seemed to me that if I didn't get out of the car, I might completely disappear. And I said, Mrs. Flaber, can you let me off here? All three heads turned my way and the abrupt quiet told me that
that I had probably interrupted someone. I just remembered, I said. There is something I have to do for my mom. I have to pick up something up for her. Where do you need to go? She asked. We can take you there and wait while you, you run inside. No, no, that's okay, I said. Actually, I feel like you walking. Are you sure? She said, pulling adroitly over to the curb. Yep, I said. Thanks. See you guys later. Have fun on your vacation. Then, looking right into Morin's eyes, I said, Call me when you get back. I tried to keep my voice steady, but my eyes were shooting out messages and questions and SOSs. I saw them reach her eyes and spark there in a flash of surprise. She turned to Mrs. Flavor and Glenna and said, I'm going to get out here too. She was out of the car and closing the door before Glenna could follow. She leaned her head inside to say goodbye. Glenna and her mother wore the startled expression of fish twitching in the bottom of a rowboat or fried on plates. Mrs. Flavor turned forward and the car moved slowly back into traffic. Crunching pebbles and grit musically beneath its tires. I was surprised too. A rush of exhilaration went through me. Maybe Maureen just hadn't seen what was happening, what Glenna was doing. Maybe I just needed to tell her. She dropped her beat-up tennis shoes onto the sidewalk and slid her toes inside. Are you mad? she asked. I just needed to explain it to her, make she, her see. That was all. No, not mad, I said. Then I said it, what was in my heart. I just miss when we were friends. I waited for her to get it. We're still friends, she said, standing on one foot to pull the back of her shoe up over her heel. She looked at me as if I had said something really humorous. You goof, she said. Hey, let's go down by the river. She started off across the spongy, shimmering parking lot of the Southern Plaza, leaving the way through the canyons of wavy heat made by the parked cars. I followed her, like maybe I had my whole life, but wanted only to keep on doing that. You know what I mean, I said, a few shades less certain, though that she would. I miss the way we used to be friends before Glenna. It crossed my mind that to anyone who happened to see us there, we would look the same as we always had. Debbie and Maron, there they are, freak and frack, my dad said. We would look the same. Did that mean something? You should give Glenn a chance, said Marin. She tries to be nice to you. We moved through a short tent of shade next to the supermarket and then the scrubby weeds that are the native flora of Selden, the kind that can grow up through concrete as long as it's not the middle part that the cars drive over all the time. The kinds of scratchy weeds that grow about 10 inches high, then branch out and blossom forth in stiff, inchy, exploded sea pods. Glenna doesn't want to be my friend, I said. Glenna wants to be your friend. 
Lena would be happy if I disappeared from the face of the earth in a puff of smoke. We looked at each other. We both knew it was sort of true, and we smiled a little bit. The way you can smile at something that is true, when it is said out loud for the first time. It was a relief, in a way, to know that Martin saw that part of it. For the moment that seemed enough, going farther seemed dangerous, like stepping off a cliff. Because I could also tell that Marn wasn't going to be deciding right then and there to dump Glenna, she didn't see why she should. I realize now that Marn saw something in Glenna that I could not see. I leave it to her biographers or maybe to microbiologists to discover what that is. Not that I was trying too hard. Anyhow, it felt safer than to leave that topic behind and take this bit of time with Martin any way I could get it. To add it to the little pile of proofs that I hoped would add up to some charm that could eventually ward off Glenna. So we squeezed between the dusty bushes to get to the river bank, where we sank our feet into the silt mud and sat on the low, bouncing branch of a big old tree that leaned out over the water. We crossed our legs like yogis and tried to balance there with our eyes closed. The shallow part of the river flowed along steadily, but in no hurry, about a foot below our branch, greenish-brown, the color of a dollar bill. We opened our eyes and dangled our feet, making wheels and eddies form around them, talking about whatever, one thing or another. The sun must have been moving along up above the trees because the patches of sunlight shifted bit by bit over the moving surface of the water, lighting up patches of our shoulders and legs and the tops of our heads. In a way, it was the best afternoon of the summer, but it was also like a prediction from the oracle at Delphi. It could mean practically anything. Analyze the text, compare and contrast. What details in the story show how Debbie and Maureen are like and different? Award-winning literature for independent reading. If you enjoyed this excerpt from Lynn Ray Perkins, All Alone in the Universe, you might want to read the rest of the novel, and perhaps also seek out other novels by the same author. Reading additional works by the authors you encounter in this anthology is one way to find literature you might appreciate outside of school. One other way to find worthwhile literary and informational texts for independent reading purposes is to seek out award-winning pieces in your local library. The following awards have earned the respect of reading teachers and librarians around the country for successfully identifying and honoring young people's reading material that is exceptional quality and likely to be loved by many. The Newberry Medal is named for John Newberry, an 18th century bookseller, but there is nothing antiquated or outdated about this honor, 
Only one title per year is graced with this prestigious award, considered by many librarians and other experts to be the premier award in young people's literature. Several books annually are designated as American Library Association, ALA. Notable children's book, which ALA defines as worthy of noting or notice, important, distinguished, or outstanding. ALA notable books are conveniently divided into three categories for younger children, for children in middle age group, and for older children. ALA notable books include informational texts as well as fiction, although fiction usually dominates each annual list. The American Library Association also administers the Coretta Scott King Book Awards, named to commemorate the life and works of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and to honor his widow Mrs. Coretta Scott King and the work she has continued to do in the name of peace and brotherhood. The Coretta Scott King Book Awards honor African-American authors and illustrators for outstanding educational and inspirational contributions to the field of young people's literature. Each year, the staff of a school library journal, a periodical intended for school librarians and media specialists, reveals thousands of books for children and teens and lists those they find most deserving of young readers' attention. The SLJ best books include dozens of realist fiction novels, works of fantasy and science fiction, and informational texts on subjects likely to interest many young people. Of course, the fact that a book has been given an award does not mean that a potential reader will find that book interesting or appropriate. You will still need to investigate for yourself, finding the book in your library or sample pages and reviews online and gouging whether the subject matter and reading level seem right for you. If your school has a librarian or media specialist, he or she can also help steer your toward promising titles. Good luck and may you open many doors onto the world of great literature and inspiring informational text, for it is fascinating, enlightening and often entertaining world to explore.